Um, I'm going to be reading from Genesis chapter 12, 1 through 5. The Lord had said to Abraham, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. So Abram left, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. So Abram went, just as the Lord had commanded him. It was a, uh, that, that, little, uh, that little phrase, so Abram went, is highlighted in my Bible. It's kind of cool that this was the section of Scripture that I was assigned. And because that's always resonated with me when, when God told Abram, go to the land I will show you and I will make you a great nation. He gave him a command, go to the land I will show you, no map, no GPS, no plan. And then he gave him a promise, I'll make you into a great nation. We hear, we hear the phrase a lot in Christian lingo, Christianese. Uh, to be called. This, uh, this little section of scripture in the modern Bible is called the call of Abram. And what does that mean? What does it mean to be called? And we're going to get into a little bit of that here in a little bit, but there's, there's three ways that we want to look at today to be called. One is to belief. One is to repentance and baptism. And the other one, and probably the most important, is a call to obedience and a continued call to faithfulness. Sometimes, though, there's a fourth call. And the fourth call is from your son, who's supposed to be, <laughs> supposed to be delivering a sermon on a Sunday morning. And I made that call to my dad, who's going to come up today, and we're going to teach through a testimony. And... So if dad, if you want to come up, I'd like to introduce my dad, Fred Woldridge. Dad is a retired full-time minister, and I've asked him to come up here uh, so we can just share a little bit more about what it looks like to answer that call. Before we begin, my life, uh, before we begin, I want to say that uh, I want to give you a, a, the genesis and the, uh, thank you, Glenn, the genesis and the evolution of how this little thing came about. Uh, when, when Tyler first approached me, he asked me if I would agree to come down here and preach. Okay. Then a few days later, he called and he said, hey, how would you feel about co-preaching? <laughs> well, you know, I've, I've preached a lot of sermons in my life and I've, I, honestly, I have never co-preached. <laughs> I, I don't have anything against it. It just never, never happened. Uh, so I, I agreed. Then a little later he called and he said, actually, you don't have to prepare anything. I'm just going to interview you. We wanted to be spontaneous. You realize that in the natural progression of something like this, the next two steps are indictment <laughs> and jury selection. So uh, I, I reserve the right not to answer <laughs> any questions that may tend to incriminate me. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is not payback uh, to put him on the spot. We were talking earlier that uh, last time he and I shared a stage outside of, outside of 
my wedding, uh, I was 10 years old, and Dad talked me into doing a skit. Um, in he front of, preached <laughs> In front of the church. But the, what, what, um, what a lot of people forget is Dad was the voice of God in that skit and took a microphone and hid in the hallway while I stood on stage as, as a 10-year-old. But um, we're, we're going to digress, and this is going to be way too long, and people are going to get hungry and, and lose focus. So, Dad... <clears throat> Let's kick this off. How long were you in full-time ministry? I can answer that. <laughs> I was in the full-time located preaching uh, ministry for 27 years. Uh, same church. First, last, and only church that I ever served full-time. And uh, so what age did you begin your paid ministry? I believe you were 16, uh, so uh, do the math. Uh, <laughs> I was a very young 46. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> so in order to do that, you, and we'll get into this in a little bit, um, you felt like you needed to have a Christian education. So, um, a la Rodney Dangerfield, you went back to school <laughs> at the age of 42. Is that a question? <laughs> well, first of all, I'm disappointed that a son of mine would have watched such an off-color uh, movie. I watched it with you, Dad. It was pretty funny. <laughs> yes, yes, I was 42 when I went back to college. So let's back up a little bit. Um, were, you, were you a churchgoer? As a child? Uh, no, no. Uh, my, my dad's parents, your great-grandparents, were very serious uh, a cappella Church of Christ. And uh, there was no a cappella church in, in our hometown. Uh, uh, my mom was raised Methodist. And <laughs> as hard as it may seem those two beliefs were never to be reconciled so no I did not attend church as a child all right so we just briefly before we started I mentioned that the the first way that we we're all called uh, is it called a belief so tell us tell us about when you became a Christian okay I I don't know how far you want to chase this uh, at, at 15, I began attending a uh, youth group at uh, the Cozad, Nebraska Church of Christ. Uh, it, it was Church of Christ name only. They actually they had a piano, a choir, and, uh, and an organ. Um, and my attendance at the youth group really had nothing to do with... Uh, um, it had nothing to do with strong faith. I, I just, honestly, I just went because my girlfriend did. Uh, then she stopped attending. Uh, in fact, she stopped being my girlfriend. Uh, but, but I kept going. Uh, I didn't become a Bible scholar, uh, but I learned enough to realize that Jesus was real and that I needed to confess my, my belief and, and be immersed in Christian baptism. So... Uh, I took that step. Then uh, I went away to college. Secular college in the late 60s and early 70s, uh, it, it was not a good place to cult cultivate a, a fragile, budding faith. Uh, so uh, make a long story short, uh, I fell away. I dramatically fell away for about 16 years. Okay. And as long as I have a grandchild in the room, uh, that's all we'll say about that. <laughs> all right. So we obviously know there was a turnaround. So um, tell us how you found your way back. Uh, well, I, I'd love to tell you that it was dramatic. Uh, but I did not experience a blinding light. I did not hear Jesus say in an audible voice, 
Fred, Fred, why do you persecute me? Uh, it, w it was actually pretty dramatic, or <laughs> pretty uh, uh, gradual. Uh, it, it was a process. First, I met and married a wonderful woman. I think you know her. <laughs> um, I, I don't know what your mother ever saw in me. I say that with, in all sincerity. Uh, but whatever it was, uh, I'll always be thankful. Uh, we had a family. <laughs> Some of them turned out okay. <laughs> so for, uh, for the sake of the kids, uh, we started attending church. Um, the same church I attended when I was 15, by the way. Uh, well, it wasn't long before, before your mother just went off the deep end. Uh, I mean, she was going to women's groups. She was going to missionary society meetings, uh, Sunday school. Uh, full disclosure, I attended Sunday school with her. Then some God things began to happen. Uh, three weeks into Sunday school class, we came to Acts 2.38. Uh, Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. When your mother learned that those words, be baptized, in the original language, were be immersed, Patton's Third Army couldn't have kept her out of a baptistry. It was going to happen. Then after that began, began a, a slow progression. I told you it was a gradual process. Not a short uh, story. <laughs> I, I became somewhat interested in scripture. Uh, I started doing some studying. I had a lot of questions, so I went to the, I went to the preacher, Bill Poling, for answers. Honestly, he did not give me answers. Instead, he gave me resources so I could find the answers for myself. Very wise on his part. Uh, Bill and I became good friends. Catherine, your mother, uh, and Bill's wife, Sandy, became dear friends also. Uh, we did a lot of things together. Bill and I spent many, many hours pheasant hunting. I think you got in on yeah, a few I, of those. Yeah, I was the, uh, the substitute dog. So <laughs> I would kick the birds up out of the ravine while Dad and Bill carried the guns. But that's, a, that's another story and something I'll tell my therapist. It wasn't long after that we actually <laughs> bought a dog. <laughs> <laughs> Bill and I actually spent more time sitting in fields discussing scripture than we ever did bringing home the game. Uh, for about eight years, Bill and I lived out Proverbs 27, 17, uh, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. So, um, <laughs> I hope you remember. If you remember what the question was, I hope that answered it. Yeah, I think, we're, I think we've got it covered. Um, what, what's been really cool about this, um, this whole process is and we spent, we spent a lot of hours to try to make this spontaneous, okay? Um, but, but, but one thing that, that I recognized is I was present during a lot of the stories that you've, you've already heard and the ones that you're about to hear. And um, having a different perspective on those stories now is really a, a cool experience. And there, there's just little nuggets that... Um, that that I pulled out while we were having this conversations because it, it all started with just me asking questions without putting something down on paper. And now there was one point when you were describing to me your, your, your transformation and you, you, you brought up the phrase having one foot in and you, you were living a life of one foot in, one foot out. What, what does that mean? Describe that for us. Well, uh, I had begun taking on more and more responsibilities in the church, but at the same time, my secular business was 
advancing. Uh, I, I tried hard to balance, it was more like juggle the, uh, the two. Now, my business required, it was legal business, but my business required that I work with some uh, less than righteous folks. Uh, you, know, you know, Jesus ate with sinners, and Jesus forgave sinners. And then Jesus told them to go and sin no more. I ate with sinners, and, and then I ordered dessert. Um, now, please, uh, don't misunderstand me. Uh, I was sincere about my work at the church, but I, I couldn't let go and, and put it before my drive for, for success. Uh, I guess you might say that for a long time, I worked hard for God's heavenly kingdom while working hard for my own kingdom. I had one foot in the church and one foot in the world. Eventually, I'd, I discovered that I couldn't do it. Uh, I was honestly doing a poor job of both. So, uh, some have the talent, honestly, some have the talent to do both. Really, Tyler, I think you have the talent to do both. But I couldn't. Uh, I kept looking back, thinking that I could make a lot more money for my family, I rationalized, if I invested more time in my secular work instead of so much time in, in the God work. Jesus said, anyone who puts his hand to the plow and then looks back is not fit for service in the kingdom of God. So oh, when, when Jesus said that, he was talking to me. <laughs> Dad, um, you know, if, we're, if you're doing the math along with this, you're 40-something, you're and you're wrestling with God, and I've heard the answer to this question, but uh, tell, us, <laughs> tell us the moment or series of moments when you finally gave in, when you finally surrendered. Get comfortable, folks. Uh, well, actually, I committed twice. First, I committed myself to God. Then later, I actually committed to, to full-time service to God. Uh, first, and I know, I know you remember... Uh, that bright, sunny day that, uh, that our whole family went kite flying. Uh, we were in a, in a fresh-cut alfalfa field across the road from, uh, from Grova's house. Uh, Grova Schmidt was early 80s, maybe. Uh, she weighed maybe 85 pounds, uh, maybe not even 85 pounds. Uh, she lost her driver's license, and her kids had taken her car from her. But, but she had an old farm tractor that she drove everywhere. <laughs> her car was safer than the tractor, actually. Um, I was a couple hundred yards, probably, from the rest of the family when I saw Grova driving into the field uh, on her tractor. Uh, no big deal. I just kept trying to fly my kite. If I remember right, there was no wind that day. Uh, but the next time I looked, my daughter, 11-year-old Edith, was on the tractor. <laughs> Edith didn't know how to drive a car, let alone a John Deere. Uh, then I saw Grova standing on the ground handing Seth up to Edith. Seth was a toddler. I, I knew this was a bad scenario. I started running as fast as I could and, and screaming at the top of my lungs. Um, 
The tractor had a hand clutch. I don't know. I don't know if, if uh, Edith bumped the clutch uh, or if it just slipped into gear, but the tractor lunged forward. Little Bitty Grova managed to throw Little Bitty Seth up to Edie. Just before Grova disappeared under the rear tire. Honestly, I was doing some sincere bargaining with God. Now, you know that I don't credit events to miracles easily, but I believe. Several may have occurred that day. Okay, miracle number one. I, I got to the tractor, got it, I got on this moving tractor, I got it stopped, and I got Edith and Seth off safely before the tractor had moved 10 feet. I have no idea. I have no idea how, uh, how I did that. I'd never operated that model tractor before. Your mom was on the ground holding Grova's head in her lap and doing some, some big time praying. <laughs> Doesn't take a tragedy for her to pray big time. <laughs> uh, there, was a, there was a rubber mark from the tire on Grova's face. She wasn't moving. Blood was trickling out of her mouth, probably internal bleeding. I ran to Grova's house, called 911, and ran back. All the time, bargaining with God. Miracle number two. Both going to the house and returning, I had to jump a ditch. We later measured the ditch, 18 feet, six inches across. You know, on my best day in high school, <laughs> on my best day, I could jump maybe just a hair over 19 feet. <laughs> Folks, seriously, I did it twice that day in blue jeans and work boots. And I was overweight. I have no idea how. Your mom, Catherine, uh, rode to town in the ambulance. I took you kids to my, my brother's house. And then I drove much faster than I should have back to the hospital. I did some more bargaining with God. Mind you, I, I wasn't just bargaining for Grova's life. I was concerned about my little girl and the guilt that she would carry with her for the rest of her life, knowing that she had run over our dear friend with a tractor. I was running down the corridor of, of the hospital toward the emergency room when I, I saw the doctor. He was walking slowly toward me, his head bowed, and he was mumbling something. When I got to him, I heard what he was mumbling, bruised, just bruised. Miracle number three. Grova was dismissed from the hospital the next day, just bruised. <laughs> Everyone in Cozad, Nebraska, had a theory as to how she survived. 
Only God and I know for sure. Well, what about, um, I was there. Um, this, it's, <laughs> I try not to think about these stories while, while dad's telling them because it's tough for, for me to get through them as well. Uh, I didn't have any trouble. <laughs> I can't make eye contact with my mother who's sitting right here in the middle either. But um, what about, <laughs> what about the, the blood? Where'd that come from? Oh, yeah. The blood. Uh, the blood running from her mouth. Uh, it seems that when the tire hit Grova's face, <laughs> it, it knocked her false teeth loose. And somehow or other, they got turned sideways, and they bit her on her cheek. <laughs> Folks, that was the worst injury she suffered that day. Uh, sometime later, I did Grova's funeral. She died peacefully, 96 years old. You know, there were consequences to the bargains that I struck with God that day. Numbers 30, verse 2, when, when a man makes a vow to the Lord or takes an oath to obligate him by pledge, he must not break his word but do everything he said. I've never shared all that was in, I've never shared all that was involved in my transaction with God that day. And I'm sorry, I'm not going to do it today either. Uh, I'll share that with you when I fulfill all of my, my vow. I will say that that day I committed myself to God. My commitment to full-time service came sometime later. Uh, after the Grove incident, God began to work and, and I began to pay attention. Uh, I spent more and more time in conversation with Bill, and uh, eventually I took on more and more leadership roles in the Cozad Church. And for some time, I thought that was enough. But in Proverbs 16.9, it says, In his heart a man plans his course, but the Lord determines his steps. In that regard, Abraham, Abram and I were somewhat alike. Although I doubt that I'd ever uh, crack the list in Hebrew 11. Um, again, we're, we are so thankful for our friends, uh, Bill and Sandy. Uh, as I began to do more and more spiritual work for God, we were, we were blessed to attend uh, Ozark Christian College preaching and teaching convention several times with them. Uh, it was at one of those events following a message by Alan Dunbar. Um, <laughs> I remember the event well. February 23rd, 1989. Lower level of the chapel, Ozark Christian College. Left hand side, four seats in. I can't, I can't begin to tell you, I can't tell you what Alan said, but I was with tears gushing down my cheeks. I, I don't cry easily. <laughs> I cry at supermarket openings. Um, <laughs> but at that time, I was called to serve. I think it was just time. As I made that decision, your mother, your mother and I both remember her saying to me, if we're going to do this thing, let's get to it. We're not getting any younger. End of chapter one. <laughs> yeah, there's no intermission today, so. Um, 
I remember, I remember after that, when you all came home, and we had the family meeting with no clear direction of where we were going, but we were moving. You were going back to school. <laughs> and uh, we, we, as a family, had no clear direction. I uh, remember it vividly, sitting in the living room. Um, but that part, and say this a bit tongue-in-cheek, that was the easy part. Um, you know, and Satan, any, anytime something's going well, Satan always likes to get in the way and, and uh, throw stumbling blocks. And people, as people try to accept, we all do this, as we, as we try to accept God's grace, there's always those moments of doubt, uh, unworthiness, just the, the overall emotions that come with it. Um, at this point, you, you knew you were committing to Christian service. What, tell, us, tell us what Satan threw your way, those temptations and stumbling blocks in that interim period. Well, at this time, Tyler will close with prayer. <laughs> wow. Um, you know, for a man never blessed with wealth, financial opportunity for us, it, it seemed to pop up at the most inopportune times. The year that we planned to migrate to OCC, uh, Lindell Luxury Cedar Homes was launching in Nebraska. Uh, I got the finished contract for their pilot home. Uh, I was on the ground floor. I could do as many of them as I had time for. Good money. I said to my wise and gentle wife, honey, if, if we stay here in Nebraska for just one more year, we can go to Joplin with some serious jingle in our pockets. She replied in her wise and gentle way, Fred Wooldridge, if you wait a year, you will never go and you know it. <laughs> to which I forcefully replied, yep. Finances, finances were a temptation for me. Uh, enough said about that. And, and it wasn't just money. Uh, I'd like to say that once we committed to this road, God cleared the way. I'd like to say that all of our friends uh, patted us on the back and, and wished us bountiful harvest fields. I'd like to say that, but... It didn't happen that way. I was really concerned about causing conflict with family and friends by our decision. Uh, there were some folks who actually depended on me for, uh, for strength and, and emotional support. Your grandpa, for one. It really bothered me. It really did. Uh, I had friends in the secular world that I sure didn't want to alienate. They certainly weren't living the life that I would have chosen for them, but, but Jesus loved them, and so did I. But I came to realize, I came to realize that conflict created for God can be good. Conflict created for God uh, can be constructive. But conflict created for God can be very, very painful. I will share one of those painful examples today. <laughs> Bill Ladwig uh, lived just 20 miles away in, in Lexington, Nebraska. Now, to understand just how how Big, rough, tough, and separated from God, Bill was. Well, it would take more time than 
we're already taking more time than we have today. Uh, uh, Tyler can share some color, colorful moments in Bill's life with you, maybe. And believe me, Tyler, you don't know half of it. Bill, Bill is a good friend. He's since passed, so I'm, 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 I know that it wouldn't bother him uh, that I use his name today. We spent a lot, of, a lot of time together before I started spending more time with Jesus. Bill had heard about my decision, and he didn't believe it. He did not buy it. Uh, not long before we were ready to move, uh, Bill came in the back door of my shop. He had a case of beer under one arm and a quart of whiskey in the other hand. He sat down on a stool and asked, and I quote, where the hell did this rumor come from that I'm hearing about you? I said, simply, it's true. I'm going to Christian college. He sat silently, staring at me for what seemed like eternity. Then, he didn't blink. And then without a word, he picked up the booze and walked out of my life. That hurt. That hurt. I was, uh, I was in the shop that day. I mean, again, my perspective is that of a 12-year-old. Right? So there's a lot of things that uh, probably got filtered out and... and uh, but I remember the conversation. I remember how brief it was. Um, and we, we've talked a little bit about this as we've been preparing for this. And um, we're not going to dwell too much on that. So let's, um, let's, let's move on past the hurt. And let's, let's jump forward. Um, you're, you're 42 years old. And you're a freshman at Ozark Christian College. What the heck were you planning on doing? <laughs> Gets right to the point, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, I guess you could call it a wilderness journey. Jesus, Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness. I spent four years at Ozark Christian College. <laughs> okay, it's not exactly the same. Um, actually, elderly ministry was always my, my strong suit. I enjoyed working with older people. That was followed by, uh, actually, by youth. It was people in the middle that I always had trouble with. Uh, yeah, but, you know, I, I was 42, and youth ministry was never a full-time youth ministry. It was never a serious uh, uh, consideration. For some time, I thought that, uh, that perhaps I would graduate and then go into uh, uh, nursing home uh, administration or, or, or some form of, of elder care. By the time I seriously considered uh, working with the elderly, <laughs> I was elderly. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> All right. So we're, we're not going to go on a day by day, and it, there's so many cool stories of God's provision during this time in uh, in our family's life. Uh, but let's 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 go two two to five years at a time here. We're going to be here a long time. But let's uh, let's move move to your junior year, and you. I remember this vividly. We went to some unique places, uh, <laughs> some stories there. But you were supply preaching, so on the weekends for extra money, you would you would. Um, go to these, these different churches that didn't have a full-time minister and, and supply preach. Um, at that point, did you think, this is it? This is, this is what I'm going to do? No, no. Uh, after, you know, after graduating from OCC, I preached for another 27 years. I always felt a call to serve. 
But I never, I'm sorry, I never felt a specific call to preach. I just saw the need and I had the ability to fulfill that need, so I did it. 30 years later, no regrets. So you went, just as the Lord instructed you. <laughs> no, uh, no finish line, no, uh, no map, no GPS, uh, a lot of good friends um, along the way, a lot of provision provided by God. But let me, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to brag a little bit on Dad. Uh, I stole some stats about time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, close to 1,500 sermons preached during this time. Um, none of them, by the way, has, I, I've never known, and I'm pretty sure this is true, Ned's never given his full testimony in a single setting in a public space. So this is, this is a lot uh, for him to share. And so um, just, just know that as you're hearing the words that we're speaking today. 134 baptisms, close to 90 funerals officiated, and uh, somewhere in the range of 50 weddings. And that's what was seen. And know that um, during, during your witness, you, you don't always get to see the fruit of the seeds that you plant. Uh, Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians <clears throat> chapter 3, Paul calls this, co-workers in God's service. Uh, he says that, Paul says, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, and, but God made it grow. And there, there's so many times that we don't get to see the fruits of the seeds that we plant, but you know, every once in a while, God gives us a, a gift. And down the road, we're, we're able to see that. We're able to see the fruit um, from the seeds that we planted, see the harvest. So you, you mentioned Bill Ladwig just a moment ago. Tell us, um, tell us how that story ends. Just can't let it go, can you? <laughs> Got to make a point here. You know I mean? <laughs> okay, seven years, approximately seven years, uh, after that uncomfortable day, I was at North Park Mall in Joplin uh, when my phone rang. It was a Nebraska number, and uh, even today, I always expect bad news when, uh, when we uh, get a call from Nebraska. So I answered. Uh, then I heard on the other end this booming voice. I mean, it would have raised the dead. He said, Fred Woldridge, you old son of a gun. I'm not sure he said son of a gun. <laughs> it was Bill. In, in shock, uh, I asked what was going on. He was driving through Springfield. Uh, he, and, uh, he and his wife, Marilyn. He tried to call when he went through Joplin, but he couldn't get me. Okay, I'll cut, I'll cut to the chase. Um, I asked Bill where they were heading, and he said, oh, we're on our way to Lexington, Kentucky, to a convention for Christian workers. <laughs> It seems that God was moving in Bill's life also. You know, for, for seven years after that day in that shop, it bothered me that Bill had decided that I was different enough that he wanted to sever our relationship. I remained upset with him for seven years. I guess forgive them, Father, for they don't know what they're doing was fine for Jesus, but it didn't fit in my philosophy very well. <laughs> I 
I know what I want to say here. I just don't quite know how to say it. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I could have, I could have taken a pull on that Kentucky gentleman that day in the shop. There's nothing in the Bible that says I can't have a cold bud on a hot day or a shot of bourbon on a cold day. Now, the Bible says lots of bad about the drinks you have after that first one. <laughs> I've just decided that I've just decided that if the second and third drink's that bad, the first one can't be all that good. But the Bible doesn't prohibit it. But I've found in the Bible that Jesus said explicitly that there are severe consequences if we cause someone to stumble. So what would have happened if I'd taken that drink? I probably would have been okay. It may not have hurt me. But what about Bill? Would I have seen my friend Bill in heaven if I had taken that friendly drink with him that day? That day in my shop, I did not condemn his lifestyle. But that day, Billy Ladwig like it or not, found out what I am and what I stand for. You know, I believe that lesson should apply to the church also. I believe as a church, we should be better known for what we are for than for what we're against. I truly believe that adventure is on that path. I, I, knew, uh, I knew when we were putting this together that you couldn't help from, from preaching during telling your story. So, <laughs> we, so let's, um, let's try to uh, bring this home and, uh, and, and teach, teach more of a lesson here in the next just a just couple minutes. Just a couple minutes. Um, that's such a cool story. Um, God's always, um, <laughs> there's always some, God, God can redeem any situation regardless of how bad it is. Um, God is, God will provide that silver lining uh, to, to every, uh, to every negative event in our lives, uh, regardless of what we think. Um, let's, let's, um, let's move away from you for a minute. <laughs> Um, Thank you. What about, and, and, and how you answered the call, because it's different for everybody. Um, what about everyone else? Uh, not, not everyone's called to be a full-time minister, and there's a lot of folks in this room, uh, the majority, that, that aren't. What about them? Uh, when we spoke, you mentioned, you mentioned that uh, Jesus taught the parable of the talents. Now, in the original language, uh, uh, talent refers to, to great wealth, uh, not necessarily uh, uh, personal abilities. However, I believe whether we're, whether we're speaking about gold or, or uh, skills and learning abilities, Jesus teaches that we are to be the best that we can be for God with what we've been given regardless of what that might be. That answer the question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. Um, so you're, you're saying that God has different expectations for what it means to be obedient, but, it, but not just different expectations, different expectations based off of those different individuals' talents or their individual circumstances. Uh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. 
Uh, you know, it's, it's like you said um, when we spoke that uh, who's, who's going to keep us safe from crime if all the cops are preaching? Folks, I have more replacement parts in my body than Napa Automotive. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have two total hip replacements. I have quadruple coronary bypass. And all of those surgeries were performed by very talented professionals. I'm sorry, Robbie Brust. I did not want you doing any of that. <laughs> okay, and, and what about the person that just has the one talent? In the parable, in the parable, Jesus didn't let that guy off either. Uh, the master expected him to make the most of what he had. As long as it's all about me, <laughs> I was never Billy Graham. I wasn't close. <laughs> But I always tried to do the best I could with what I was given. I had the honor, I had the honor of doing a funeral for a very dear friend just recently. Frankie worked at the Bartlett Co-op most of his adult life. Never got through high school. No social graces at all. After I baptized him, he did all his talents allowed him to serve Jesus. But he wasn't given much. <laughs> After accepting Jesus, Frankie worked hard to finish what he felt called to do. And he accomplished it all before he died. He felt that his calling was to quit smoking, drinking, and cussing, attend church every Sunday, and never let the preacher buy his own coffee at the co-op. <laughs> We're all called. We're all called for different purposes. But folks, we're all called to serve Jesus. But, uh, this has been such a cool experience. Uh, for me, and I, and I hope that, I hope, and, and we've prayed a lot leading up to this, um, that, that the message that, that we've crafted here today, the stories that, uh, that Dad told, Dad had the hard part today, mind you. Um, I hope that it, it, um, you know, it touches you, um, inspires you. We, we mentioned today, we're, we're all called. So, what's your call? Now, maybe, maybe you believe, but you're harboring some unresolved sin. Your call today is, is to confess. Maybe you believe, and you've repented, but you, that's where you're at. You haven't taken that next step. Your call today, your call is to be baptized. Maybe, maybe you're a believer. Maybe you're a very similar story and you stepped away in your faith and your call today is to, is to recommit. You know, everyone's being called. Um, God is always calling you. But he's always faithful. In Matthew chapter 28, 
when Jesus delivers the Great Commission, uh, he gave a command, but he also gave a promise. He says, surely I'm with you always. To the very end of the age, um, we're going we're gonna to finish with a song. Uh, in fact, I was, I was told by Dad this is the song that I don't know if they still do it. At the end of the preaching and teaching convention at Ozark Christian College, this is the song that they end with. So it's, it's very fitting. Um, I asked my good friends to come up and lead this song, and they had never heard of it, so we'll, uh, we'll get through it. But take some time while we're singing this song, and listen. Listen to where God is calling you. And if you're wrestling with something, which I'm sure most of you are, we all are, we give you this time. Come forward. Or find one of the shepherds that are in our congregation and share those, share those thoughts. We'll pray with you. We'll, we'll help you take that next step. Or come find Dad. Uh, he's got nothing else to do. <laughs> No, but won't you, won't you answer that call today? Take up thy cross and follow me. I heard my master say, I gave my life to ransom thee, surrender your all today, wherever he leads I'll go, Where So wherever he leads, I'll go. He drew me closer to his side. I sought his will to know. And in The Children of Adventure Church will give our communion meditation this morning. Today happens to be Palm Sunday, so we will read scriptures that help connect Jesus as our King with Jesus as our crucified Savior King. These first readings are from John 12. They describe when Jesus came to Jerusalem the Sunday before he was crucified on Friday. So today is the beginning of Holy Week. John 12:12. 12, 12. The next day, Sunday, there was a great crowd who had come for the Passover festival. They also heard that Jesus, the one who raised Lazarus from the dead, was on his way to Jerusalem. Jesus was riding on a young donkey when he came to Jerusalem. The people took palm branches and went to meet Jesus, shouting, Hosanna, blessed in the, he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed in the King of Israel. Today is called Palm Sunday. Today we remember the Sunday in the Bible when people laid down palm branches for someone to ride or walk on. Palm branches meant that they thought the person was a great leader or even a king. 
It also meant that they were celebrating some kind of great victory. Even the children were shouting, and as you know, we can shout really loud. <laughs> Hosanna! Bad people tried to stop the children, but Jesus said if you stop the children from shouting, even the rocks will cry out. So this exciting victory ride into Jerusalem happened on the Sunday that begins Holy Week, which is today. But Palm Sunday also means something else. It means that this coming Thursday, night of Holy Week, is when Jesus will give us the ceremony that we call the Lord's Supper. We take a bit of bread and a sip of juice to help us remember the body and the blood of Jesus given up for us. After the victory ride in the Lord's Supper, Jesus will go with his close friends, the disciples, into a garden. Judas was one of those close friends. Judas will betray Jesus that very same night after the Lord's Supper. Then this coming Friday, we remember when Jesus got executed and died in the Roman way by being nailed to a cross. But then, after three days, or that is next Easter Sunday, Jesus comes back to life. The King reigns. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Many, many people went out to meet Jesus, to meet Jesus along the road where the palm branches and people's coats were laid down. Some people called Pharisees were trying to stop the big parade and all the shouting, but they gave up. They said to each another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Much later, after Jesus died and came back to life, the Apostle John had a vision and wrote the book of Revelation. He said, I looked, and there before me was a crowd, great people, um, so many that no one could count them all. There were people there from every nation, tribe, and village, even every language. And John was not done. They were all there, John said. I, was saw, I saw all the people standing there before the throne of God. And Jesus, the Lamb of God, was there. And all the people were wearing white robes and holding palm branches in their hands. Revelation 7, 9. So in keeping with what, with what John saw, all of us are dressed in white robes and we are holding palm branches today. We use palms to remember our own victory, every death because of Jesus. Of course, it also costs the Son of God his own life, his own blood given, and his own body nailed to the cross. We proclaim this when we gather around the table to take the Lord's Supper. Here now a reading from Paul the Apostle first. Corinthians 11, 24, 26. Paul said, I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took some bread from the Passover feast and when he was given thanks he broke it and said this is my body that is for you do this in remembrance of me in the same way he took the cup also after supper saying this cup is new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. All right, would everyone please stand? So everyone who believes this message about Jesus is invited to take the Lord's Supper with us. This is when we remind ourselves of Jesus' great sacrifice and giving his body and his blood uh, for us. We are also proclaiming to the world that Jesus came back to life. He is with us right here, right now, and he's coming back to earth to show us that death really has been swallowed up in victory. Let's pray before we take the Lord's Supper together. Father, thank you for these children. Um, and thank you for the lessons that we can learn from them. Um, as we come up here to take this bread and juice, help us to remember what these two things represent um, in our lives for, for you. And it's in your name I pray. Amen. Amen. What a fun day. Amen. Amen. I'm telling you. Uh, we, had, we had church today, y'all, and uh, yeah, thank you. Wow, there's so many things I want to say about the story of Fred and the two bills, um, but uh, that's kind of the way I thought of it. Brother, thank you. I have so much respect for you and love for you, and uh, just the clarity of your call and the clarity of how you've called other people is so powerful. And Tyler, where you at, brother? 
Way to go. But I will say this, you know what happens when two guys preach one sermon? You're in church for an hour and a half or more. So what I mean, you know what I'm saying? But uh, wow, so many, so many things that I took notes on that I just, man, so powerful, so, so powerful and so thankful. And those of you that are in robes up here, young people, way to go. That was really, really cool. Yeah. <laughs> and Seth and Ashley, Ashley, who's our children's director and her husband, Seth, who was pressed into service. And Charlie, I think was the, <laughs> Charlie Coyle was the instigator of that idea. So uh, man, God's at work. Let's share that with other people. It's so important. This week is a great time to do that. Share with other people how much uh, you love Jesus and invite them to come be a part of what God's doing at Adventure. Um, We're going to pray in just a moment before that, just a little housekeeping, uh, because next week we're not going to be here. Um, We're going to do teardown exactly the same as normal, except for this one thing. Uh, Everything that's in the nursery, we want it to go outside and be put on the sidewalk because we're going to load it into uh, our car and take it. All right. So I just want to let you all know that. Um, But other than that, it's good. So let's stand together and let's pray and then we'll be dismissed. God, we thank you. We thank you, we thank you for the testimony of your faithfulness. God, we thank you for um, a guy like Bill Poling, who took the time to be a disciple maker, to pour himself into uh, Fred, and for Catherine and her faith, and, and for their willingness to listen to your voice, and, and God, for their willingness to follow you. And we thank you, God, for the legacy that's left through children, grandchildren, and even... even uh, even more so with uh, people that none of us may ever meet in this life. We thank you, God, for that. God, help us to remember to do everything that we can with what you've given us. We love you, and we praise you, and we pray that you would empower us as we go out today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.